he set the tone for 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 a change in how um, um, how we we'll take as a country we will take forward that struggle. Coming back to our time in 1976, we are aware that there was a Soweto uprising that led that actually shaped the history in, in South Africa in our struggle, and it was led by young people. Fast forward to the now in 2015, where the fees must fall once again led by young um, university and tertiary, uh, and tertiary um, um, students for, for, for the emancipation of the education sector to allow um, for the right of education across um, all sectors of society, no matter what income group you come from. So this alone actually tells us that throughout history, whether in, in our own continent or in the globe, the young people have always been um, in the forefront of actually taking on a baton and fighting a struggle that was relevant to their time. So what is our struggle today? Our struggle today uh, as the young generation is a struggle against corruption. I think we have seen uh, with this COVID-19 situation that we find ourselves in, the amount of looting that is taking place, not only in my own country, but across, um, across the continent, and I'm sure across the world as well, because corruption is not unique to any, any tribe or any race. Corruption is a phenomenon that occurs in all human races. It occurs in all economies. It occurs across all spheres of, 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 of society. And therefore, with that, it made me realize that, you know, we are forging a different struggle. Our struggle is unique in the sense that it's a two, it's a two pronged struggle, I always say. We are waging a struggle where we are still yet to be free because we are not economically free. We are politically free as a continent, but we are not yet free economically. So the, the residue of the struggle that our former forefathers fought is still being carried on into our generation. While we're facing that, we find ourselves now in a situation where we are now waging a struggle where we are actually being oppressed by our very own liberators. Our own, own leaders are the ones who are actually, that we're actually now we're finding ourselves having to, to come up as a young people and find democratic ways of solving the problems that we're faced with. Because right now, our own liberators are the ones who are now forming a new struggle against the continent, and that's the struggle of corruption. We know that corruption steals from economies. We have seen how much it's ravaged a lot of economies. It causes economic rampage of the worst kinds. We know for a fact right now, for in our own country and many other countries in our continent, where we are in entering what, I'm, what I call, almost what I call a sovereign debt crisis, where the yoke of burden that we are facing right now is the yoke of burden of finding ourselves in a financial constraint that has been self, I would say, has been self-imposed upon ourselves due to the politics that we find ourselves in. And therefore, that struggle becomes a unique struggle. And there is a struggle is just as important and crucial as all the other struggles that we have had to face as the African children. What is more crucial with this struggle is that it ravages us not only economically, but the impact of that, it becomes socioeconomic. It becomes a health impact. For example, the PPE scandals that we have seen recently. Those scandals are now leading to a situation where even people's lives are at risk due to corruption. It ravages families because when there is no economic livelihood, what happens to families? They are torn apart. Fathers are, are, are forced to seek work in, 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 in other shores, to leave the continent and seek of greener pastures elsewhere in the world. So families are torn apart, families are destroyed. We enter into a situation where due to the economic imperatives, we find ourselves faced with the, in the impact of issues like gender-based violence. Over and above that, what it causes? It causes political instability because when there is no money, there's a scramble for resources, there's bound to be a scramble for power as well. So what we see recently right now is a situation where even our own security as a continent is at risk. I'll mention the issue if, uh, where we found the ISIS that have actually landed in our shores through the SEDEC in Mozambique. I'll mention Mali as another situation we'll discuss later on. I'll mention quite a few where you find ourselves that true to economic instability and political instability, we find our countries being torn into a situation where it's actually we are going into a place of our countries being nations. And therefore, it is our time as a young generation of this era to take on that baton and to wage a new fight. It's not necessarily going to be a physical fight or a bloody fight for that matter. I do not advocate for regime change at all. I do stand for democracy, the rule of law, and constitutionalism. However, we have to be courageous 
and bold. We can no longer be tweeting and Facebooking and not, and it's good for us for, to be, for our voices to be heard, but we need to become more active and more visible and more, and become in the forefront in terms of being the generation that is going to take on the very same struggle that we're facing now, which is the struggle of corruption that is ravaging our continent. And therefore, with that said, there's three, there's three issues that I would like to bring to our attention, which are very crucial for me to, to, to actually explain right now. My understanding is that one of the things that causes corruption to become so rampant is the fact that there is no rule of law. In some cases where there is a rule of law, there is no strong sense of accountability because the laws themselves that are there are probably not strong enough to ensure that those that need to be held accountable are actually held accountable. Therefore, there's a need for economic, I mean, sorry, there's a need for constitutional reforms where it's possible in some of our continents or some of our countries, sorry, in the continent, where we find that the laws are not strong enough to deal with the issues that need to be dealt with to, to strengthen the constitution, the constitutions that are the Supreme Court, that are the Supreme laws, sorry, of those lands. And thereafter, we need to have strong judiciaries because without the judiciary as a backbone of the law, is we have no place to turn to as a young generation of Africans for the law is the, the ultimate and the supreme, and the supreme um, commander of ensuring that those that are responsible are held to account. We find ourselves where in a situation where we are faced up with very weak institutions. How many times do we hear of those who have wronged us economically in the continent, having been jailed, having been prosecuted and been jailed, tried and jailed? We know for, of, 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 of instances where for human rights violations, some of the leaders do actually take, um, you know, take uh, are accountable and are actually held accountable for that. But for, however, for economic injustices, how many, how many do we actually see having to face the same full might of the law? So therefore, it is our time as a young people to forge the front, to forge a, a hedge and to lead from the front to ensure that constitutionally and democratically, we take on that baton to protect Africa from further ruin because Africa has been ruined in the past through, through imperialism and through um, apartheid and through um, 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 a neo um, neocolonialism, sorry. And therefore, with, with knowing all this history, why then do we allow ourselves to then re-oppress Africa by now being the ones that are stealing from the very same continent we seek to emancipate? So we're fighting a double, like I said, we're fighting a double, a double pronged struggle right now. And it is time for young people to get off from the back seat and to come to the front seat and to actually be part of the, the, the generation of the younger people, of young people that are going to actually fight this economic war that we face, this political and economic crisis the continent is in. Because if we do not do that, ladies and gentlemen, our continent is going to be in ashes. There will be no continent to call home at all. And therefore, as Africa 55 states, the organization that I belong to, we are advocating that we have a pan-African youth parliament that is going to look after the interests of young people. And it's not about any political party, but it's about all young people of the continent of Africa coming together and being able to have debate and talk to issues that are talking to them directly bread and butter issues that are facing them on a daily basis as African children. So we're advocating strongly with our relationship with the African Union to ensure that the Africa is, is, is afforded, Af African young children are afforded the opportunity to have their voices heard through such a formation. And over and above that, we are advocating for a reform, we are advocating for the reforms in our current laws to relook at the laws that govern the continent from our constitutions to our legislations and to have a look at them and to actually assess to what extent do these laws ensure that the rule of law is applied, that there is accountability, that there is justice, that there is a human rights culture in the continent, that the law takes its place where it has to for all those who have economically done injustice to the continent, no matter if they are presidents or leaders or ministers or traditional leaders or whatever they may be. So we're advocating for reforms in our law, starting with our respective constitutions that actually govern us as a continent. We are also calling on the young people's voices to the, <clears throat> to the media. We know very much that the media has been for, for, for quite a long time 
not been actively been showcasing the good story that Africa has to tell. Many a time Africa is showcased as a ravaged place with no potential, with hungry people, with, with, um, with tired and hungry people with no, 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 no hope. And so we are saying that we need to have a, a generation of young people that are gonna showcase the potential that the continent has and all the good stories that are there because Africa with all the, the ravages known and all the, and, and, and all the hell that has been through, but it's been resilient. And our people have been come educated They've become lawyers, they've become doctors, they've become neurosurgeons. However, many of these skills have left the continent and therefore there is no more building that is actively taking place in the continent because most of the skills that belong to us are out, out there in the diaspora. So we're advocating for our young Africans to come back home and to rebuild using our, our, our skills force and capacity to come back home and to rebuild this continent of ours. And there's no greater time that we are in than right, that the time we're in right now. We know that the African Union has actually approved the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, which to me is the most exciting time that we have as a continent because it, it gives us an opportunity to rebuild the continent ourselves as African children. And therefore, without a further waste of time, I would like to say we call upon all young people of the continent in all corners, as well as in the diaspora, to understand and to realize that there's no better time than now to rebuild the same place we call home. That, in, that it, despite the wars, despite the pains, despite our people having fled the continent to other places in the world because there is no hope, despite the political instability, despite the corruption, we do not and dare not and will not give up on this precious place that we call home. And therefore now I will continue. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, comrade, sister. Uh, that was a nice presentation. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you've got the question, just raise your hand uh, for our sister to, to answer. I will start first. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I would like to know, you, you mentioned that corruption is not uh, associated or is not found in only one particular race or people or country. Yeah. Uh, in language, we believe that if something has been common uh, in a particular area, definitely you have the name in that language. So may I ask, which part of Africa are you from? OK, I am from South Africa. I currently reside in Gauteng province in Johannesburg. Uh, I am born in the Eastern Cape um, and I was, I was born in the Eastern Cape, raised in the Eastern Cape. I went to study in KwaZulu Natal. I got married in KwaZulu Natal. I work in KwaZulu Natal. So KwaZulu Natal is, is home. Um, and, but I currently work and live in Johannesburg at the moment. So I am from, I'm probably South, South African, but I'm also a strong Pan-Africanist. Thank you. Okay, yes. Uh, I want to know from the language spoken in your area, from where you come from, do you have a name for corruption in your language? Sure. That's a good question, actually. Um, sure. As far as I know, I would say Ukunchoncha, Ukweba, um, is to, which means to steal. Uh, that's actually the, the, those, those are the closest terms that actually come to mind. It's Ukunchoncha, which is Zulu, Ukweba in Kosa, which is to steal in English. So in our African language, we, as was, yeah, corruption is actually associated with stealing, which is Ugunchonja and Ukweba. So yeah, I think just to answer that question, I think you've actually got a, that's a very good question because I think as African children, we know that in our culture, stealing is something that is not allowed or accepted. And we, we, in fact, we are brought up with those value systems as Africans. So it actually becomes very disappointing when you actually see the extent of stealing that is actually become synonymous with our various leaders in different roles across the continent. Because we know that in our African value system, the culture of 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 stealing is something that is a taboo and that's not allowed and that is not celebrated. So yeah, that's a very good question in actual fact. I actually like the way the fact that you asked that. Um, it's something foreign to our culture in actual fact, but however, it's become very much part of, of, of our survival in our modern day. But yet, it's not actually a cultural thing now as us as Africans at all. 
So a very good question. I appreciate that. So it's in Yes, it's actually stealing or thieving in English. Thank you very much. Yeah, guys, the floor is open. If you have a question, you just indicate. Okay, uh, you 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 talk about African Fifty Five advocating uh, for a Pan African Parliament, youth parliament for, for young people. Yes, yes. Uh, maybe the young people would like to kind of have a list or state some uh, some of the ways they can help in the fight against corruption. Okay, very yeah. good point. Um, firstly, by us actually uh, advocating for a Pan-African Youth Parliament, it is part of um, the succession planning that we believe that somehow is being suppressed. I'll explain why I'm saying that. If you look at the history of our, our political struggle in the continent, you always note that it's almost um, it was 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 actually known who would succeed the next leader because there was succession planning. It was it was actually it was strategically planned and 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 and, and decided upon by our former leaders. And it's very crucial, um, you know, to prepare then those young people. The reason for that was to prepare those young people to take on the baton and to be the next generation that would lead um, the you know the, the 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 next part of the next phase of whatever the struggle was at the time. And therefore, we find in our present day situation right now, the unfortunate part where you find that the succession planning isn't there or is not as vigorous as it was before. And therefore we, we feel that there is a leadership gap by not allowing that succession planning to take place. You automatically uh, create a, lead, a leadership gap uh, politically. And therefore, when you have that, you risk the situation where even if the older leaders or, the, or our elders want to give, to give power, but there is, if I think if they look at it, there's no one to give the power to because there's that vacuum uh, that's been created, whether deliberately or not, we don't know, but there's that leadership gap. And so we feel that by allowing a pan-African uh, pan African parliament across all the states in the continent, remember we represent all the states in the entire continent. So by allowing for that formation, it gives young people their own voice, whereas at the same time, it allows them a space for mentorship, for guidance, for leadership and for preparation of political leadership per se. So by allowing that, um, that uh, succession plan to take by, by Troy, that uh, uh, formation to take place, you are actually rising above the politics of countries and the politics of political parties per se, and you are creating a structure where young people across the entire continent become led, become groomed for leadership of the continent for the things that the continent need to, you know, they, 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 they need to work for. Um, I would say, I, would, I don't wanna go into specifics of political parties. Um, I don't wanna go that route, but I'll say that once you start to silence the voice of, of any youth uh, formation in a political party or any youth league, for whatever reason, maybe for political or whatever reason, you sort of, um, you, you diminish the potential that is there for that formation to play its role in becoming almost like um, a, a checker of the mother body in any formation. So obviously, remember, young people, uh, whatever whatever the older generation does, has a direct impact on them as a younger generation. So once you suppress that voice, where they don't they don't have a political uh, a political strength or will within within themselves as, as, as a young youth for, of young formation, you 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 basically almost sabotage the agenda of the youth, if I may put it in that way. And therefore, by you doing that, you actually risk the risk of overimposing your leadership as the, as the, as the elder or as the mother body upon, that, and upon the society. And that is why you find now, because of that, more and more young people become demoralized to actually take place in politics, uh, to become active because they know that, um, you know, whatever they say, it it's, it's basically becomes meaningless because they don't have a, a, an older body to you know to to 
to, to look after them and to look after their interests and to drive their agenda. If you look uh, probably now in our own parliament and maybe many across the continent, they say, if you look at the speeches and, you know, and look at the discussions that are taking place, you find that there's less and less of the agenda of the, of the crimes of the young people being taken into cognizance as building up, as building blocks for, for the future, if I may put it in that way. I know I'm being very general right now, but that is precisely because of the fact that their voice is not there and therefore there is no uh, space for, or for, for mapping up what becomes a direct, uh, uh, what's the word? A direct agenda that impacts on the young people and their generation to come, if I may put it that way. For example, the issue of corruption is a very serious issue. And I believe that if we had a very strong youth presence in our politics, would you, we would begin to see probably a, a better energy uh, and, and a better change in terms of accountability of, of, of those issues. However, without um, you know, sounding uh, contradicting myself, I wanna also say that young people themselves have allowed that virtue to be created by not taking up that space. I'm not saying they should force it, but I'm saying by not deliberately taking up that space, they have actually allowed their own voices to become silenced. And so what we're saying is that we wanna create a safe space that's non-political, that is non, um, that's not recognizing one country over the other, but that's giving, generally giving all the young people of the continent a united voice to, to speak to issues that affect them directly as they uh, forge a way to form their own, uh, to map up their own future. Um, 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 for, our, for, our, for ourselves and our future generations as well. So by creating that formation, it's a very huge vision. It's to actually speak to where we see ourselves uh, and where we see the agenda of the continent in the future, in alignment obviously with the current AU agenda and our respective countries' agendas as well. So it's to allow young people to actually become the future driving force and to also allow them space to, to be active in the political space. I always say uh, to colleagues that politics is not a dirty game. It's always been known to be a dirty game, but it's not. Politics is a very humanitarian and a noble cause. If you look at history and the people who've led politics of that, that you know, they've become our icons because they all led a noble cause. It was a humanitarian cause. They became actively engaged in politics because they wanted to drive a change. So over time, politics have become polluted because people then began to drive their own personal interest and agenda over and above that of the people that um, they serve. So we are trying to say we want to become, we want to enter into what we call political hygiene, if I can use the term. We want to enter a political hygiene where we allow politics to play the role that they were actually allowed, that they were actually uh, uh, from history were playing. And so we want, we want to advocate for clean politics through democratic processes to the rule of law, to separation of powers, and to allowing um, young people that space to be the active drivers of that. I believe to a certain extent, what you see happening in the continent right now is precisely because young people have been in the backseat. And I know I'm gonna sound controversial by saying this, but it's precisely because of that, because young people's voices are not playing the role that they are. And I said earlier on, if you look at the history of our struggle that our forefathers waged, they waged those struggle, that, that struggle in a young age because they were driving something that spoke to their time, something that was gonna drive the change they wanted to see happening in their time. Therefore, even for us as this generation, it is us who are gonna drive the agenda against anti-corruption, against um, non-constitutionalism, against autocratic governments, against not having separation of powers and not having a rule of law in place. Therefore, we, we feel very strongly that we need to allow young people to actually have that space by creating such a formation, continental wide, and, um, and, and yes, to speak to the issues that affect all the African children across the continent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody with a question, please? Uh, I saw one question here on the chat. Yes. This is from uh, Sisanda Mbete. Yes. OK. Yeah. Please go ahead. You can read it and answer it. OK. It says, where can the youth start with fighting corruption? That's a good question. Where can each of us do? What can each of us do locally in our areas, in our towns, in our residence? Thank you very much. In fact, it starts it start by you engaging. Thank you for that question, Sisanda. It starts by you engaging your very own local councillor 
at the level that you're at, because you know government starts at a local government level. And I believe that's the same across the continent and across the world. That's the norm, that's the framework. So you need to engage your local councillor more. For example, if there is, for example, a tender for waste in as an example, a simple example, in your area where people, where it, it, it's, it's been alleged or it's been known by two audits or investigations that it's gone to Sisanda as opposed to, um, to, uh, to Mliba or whoever. As a, as, 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 as a young generation of young people of that area, it is a responsibility to write and engage your local councillor and say, we became aware that though we know that the rules and the processes of council for, uh, for supply chain are A, B, C, D, M, G. However, we became aware that A, B, C, and D got awarded a tender uh, without following due process. And, and you start to engage and you say, we would like to know what is going to be done by yourself uh, as representative of our ward to the council about this matter. And we're going to be doing follow-ups and, 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 and asking for feedback. So we engage at that local level. I see a lot, lot of the times people, we tweet, we, we, you know, we are there on Facebook, we are commenting on Twitter, on, on Facebook, on Instagram, et cetera. We're angry and rightfully so, but yet we're not doing anything about it. And yet those structures are there, they're legally there, they're legally formed to, to be answerable to the people, yet we do not engage them, but we complain. So it starts, Mrs. Sander, as, 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 as something as small as writing a letter to your, to your local councillor and engaging them and asking for follow-ups and asking for feedback you know, and interrogating that information. And you continue, you know, you continue creating that pressure. It's your right. It is very much a democratic right. And it starts at that level. And then you become, and then you obviously do it obviously in the provincial level, at a national level as well. We just also, I won't go into details, also ourselves as an organization have entered in the space. So we're actually now starting to tackle issues directly that are, that are impacting on the country, uh, on legal cases that are there and things that are happening in the country as well. To show that we are not just talking, but we are also acting and we are becoming, if we're saying people must do something, we need to lead by examples and do it ourselves. So we have done that as well. And we are gonna to continue to do that, not only in the country, but in the entire continent as well. So it starts by engaging this. And I always say, the unfortunate part is sometimes you find that our leaders, they um, become, being a politician is like celebrity status. Um, they become disengaged from their people. When once they get elected and they get into those positions, they become inaccessible uh sometimes arrogant they become celebrities celebrities you know as politicians and therefore there's that it creates that gap between them as, as leaders and the people but for us to close that gap we must close it by engaging them it's our constitutional right to do so so you engage you interrogate you write formally and in fact if if, if possible you can form as a group and actually be engaged in your local municipality, you know, where there's a council meeting, you have every right, um, you know, by following due process to actually be there and to engage and to, and, and to demand those answers, to ask those questions and to demand those answers. Because for as long as we do the talking and we do not actually act, we'll continue to perpetuate a culture where corruption happens and unabated and doesn't get dealt with because we ourselves don't actually take that step to actually ask the right questions. And, 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 and demand accountability and demand action. So I hope I've answered your question, Sandra. but yes, it starts as little as in your local level where you are engaging your local councillor, engaging your politicians, not only on Twitter, on Facebook, but in formally writing to them, get them to be aware that you are aware of A, B, C, and D, and you want it to be solved and, and to know how it can be solved. And you follow up, you know, engage even <clears throat> your political party oppositions as well to say we are aware that this is what's happening we want even your voice to be elevated you know to take this on you know against whoever is the ruling party of the time whichever country it is so it starts with us asserting ourselves and asserting our voices so yes thank you very much for that question Susanda. okay thank you very much uh Susanda and uh comrade uh zana please okay Lamin Mane has a question. Yeah, there is somebody called Lamin has uh, raised up. Uh, yeah. Yeah, okay, I'm here. Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Yeah. Please go ahead. Good, good, yeah. afternoon. good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you very much yes. for that great presentation, my sister. It's really, really, really mind boggling. When you talk Africa, when we talk about corruption in Africa, it's just sometimes you don't know where to start. Sister, my first question will be, do you think corruption and COVID-19, which one is the worst disease for Africa? Because for me, I thought, I think 
corruption is a disease of itself which has greater impact on our people than, than anything else because it takes so many things from us. And then my second question is that if, if we want to ad address corrupt corruption, do you think it's the best that we started from downwards than to go up? In that, in, that, in that sense, what I mean is that can we start from going to our schools and we try to build our, our young people's moral ethics of how to be a good leader, to, to enable to, en to build them up until, until they, they, they get at the, at the time of taking responsibilities. But as a Gam Gambian, what, what I've realized is that if you are a young Gambian, you finish your education, you want to go to work, you went to an office, you, you meet an elderly person. The first thing they will tell you, you come here to work, you have to do as we do. And if you cannot do as we do, then you, you can't stay. Because if, you're, if your belief doesn't go with that, the culture of that organization, so it's better you leave. Because if you want to change, you keep end up fighting with them. And at the end, it leads to so many other bad things happen to people who want to change the system. And at the end, they might lose their life or they lose so many other things. So for me, I think the question is, do we need down up approach instead of top down approach for, for us to address corruption. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, Kosazana. Thank you very much uh, for your question, my brother. Um, I would say the COVID 19 corruption is corruption itself. Um, you know, it's just unfortunate and very sickening actually that. Uh, during them in the middle of a pandemic, people will find an opportunity to steal, uh, not only from their own governments and their own states, but to steal from the poor and to steal from the sickly. You know, it's actually something that is very abnormal, if I can put it that way. It's very disgusting. It's very, it can't be tolerated. It can't be accepted. So we do need to adopt a zero tolerance approach when, where that is concerned. Uh, COVID-19 is a pandemic uh, globally, we know, but yet, um, so I can't say one is more important than the other. Uh, COVID-19 is quite serious. Uh, it's unfortunate that we actually, you know, we, we had to um, inherit it as the, as the rest of the world did. However, uh, corruption, I can't say corruption is more important or less important than COVID-19. Corruption is a disease on its own if it becomes systematic and undealt with because, I'll explain why I'm saying that. It, it causes sicknesses because when you, when you become corrupt, you steal from your very own health budgets that are meant to assist those that are actually sickly to get well. So it steals from your, it steals from your, from your health system. It steals from your health budgets. It steals from your education system because if there is corruption and there's money looted, you are unable to, to, to advance the causes that are there, are, are, are there to, to strengthen education. So it's also, uh, uh, you know, it, it dampens your education. It, it, it weakens your education. It weakens even the, 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 the outcomes of the, ex, uh, the experts that will be birthed by that country through the budgets that that country has. Corruption not only causes that, it causes death on people, as we know. As I said earlier on, corruption causes families to flee from each other and to, and, and to, and to find themselves uh, elsewhere in the world because their, their economies have been ravaged and there's no employment opportunity. So corruption does that. Um, corruption causes gross unemployment and poverty. It causes political instability due to poor governance. Uh, it causes peace and security risks. I was actually listening to uh, a clip on Morning Live um, a few days ago, which I won't go into detail for security reasons, but uh, just a little bit of, a, just to explain, you find that when you steal so much from a country, even your defense budget gets affected. Do you understand what that means? Your very same defense doesn't have enough money to tackle issues, to strengthen the defense force and to tackle issues that are as a security risk to your country because of the fact that there is no enough money in your economy. And this cuts across all the countries uh, across the continent. So corruption actually even weakens your strength in terms of your own security. You become at risk. We know right now the SADC is at risk because we are aware that there's, um, there was the issue of, the, there is the issue of ISIS that have taken up the port in Mozambique. We are aware of the Boko Haram in Nigeria you know, in the eastern part of the, of the continent. So we know for a fact that once you, if corruption is not dealt with, it even weakens the capacity for our own defense mechanisms to actually fight for us. It weakens governance. We know that for a fact, if there's no money, you can't govern. Um, 
Um, it, it, it causes mistrust in leadership and therefore causes political tension, which may turn to political violence. Uh, it, it, it exacerbates a growing inequality in education. We know that for a fact and causes poor education, as I've mentioned before. It's, it dampens your efforts to fight for HIV and AIDS, TB and all other diseases, as well as the, the coronavirus. It causes, it, it exposes, in fact, it, it makes us as Africans become even more vulnerable to a second phase of colonization because other countries see our weaknesses and they find ways to exploit it because they know that we don't have money, we're desperate, and therefore they come in to help us. But in that process, it exposes us to a risk of a possibility of being uh, colonized again in a different way. So there's the, I'm not saying it's a fact, I'm saying there is that risk. Because when you don't have money, anybody who comes to assist you, you will be open to them. And therefore, even your own enemies can find a way to creep in and later on actually take charge. Um, it causes us to be in a place of desperation because like I said earlier on, when we find ourselves where we don't have money because we have to borrow from IMF and borrow all these other loans that we're actually you know, borrowing because we mismanage our own uh, economies through corruption, we become desperate, we become surrendered to loans and therefore it becomes an, a perpetual state of, 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 of borrowing, of, of, of being in loans. And so we sit with this yoke of burden as Africans where our genera generations to come after us are going to be paying back loans that were created due to bad leadership that didn't tackle corruption in our time. So uh, I, I would say to you, my brother, looking at, looking at this crisis, the coronavirus, you can manage. It's a risk. It's a, it's a reality in terms of, a, of, of, of health. It does cause people to die, but it's something that is, is manageable and controllable. But however, if you are corrupt and you become even more corrupt during a pandemic, you totally surrender, not only your people, uh, you know, from a health point of view, but you surrender your economy to a weak state where it's, it's, it can't even defend itself. It becomes surrendered to foreign debt. So you actually, as a continent, you've actually become, we surrender ourselves to the next phase of being our, ourselves, allowing ourselves to become colonized in yeah. another sense. So I know that sounds a bit, a bit strong to say, but I'm, I'm trying to send a strong statement to say, once we undo the legacy of corruption ourselves and drive the change as this generation, it has a whole lot of impacts that are good for us in the long term, as I mentioned before. Mm -hmm. So you undo all these things that I've done. So you judge for yourself if, if, if it's coronavirus, if it's none to me is worse than the other. However, corruption is actually, is actually when, especially when we, when, when we self-impose that the hunger and the poverty because we don't know how to manage or we don't want to manage our economies properly. The policies are there, the procedures are there, the rule of law is there, all those good things are there. However, because of weak leadership or because of leadership that is politics that are, are more self-serving than serving the people, you know, we deliberately surrender ourselves to a point as Africans or we become beggars when you do not have to. I always say to myself, why as a continent that is so wealthy with so much of natural yep. resources, do we find a situation whereby we are poor and we are begging, yet we are rich? Something mm -hmm. is wrong. Somebody is selling out. And by selling us out through corruption, we are then self-sabotaging ourselves as a continent. So it becomes an issue of leadership. That's why I was saying we want to drive the change as young people by grooming the right leadership mm -hmm. to take over the continent in the, in, in the long run. So to, to, I hope that answers that first question. The other question that you asked me, you were saying, is the top-down or bottom-up approach? I would say, in fact, in our curriculum at schools, we should maybe to true life orientation, we should start educating our children about uh, mm -hmm. corruption and the impact thereof. So that we undo the, like I said earlier on, as Africans, our culture is not to steal. We are taught from yeah. a young age not to steal. We don't, stealing is not in our nation, it's not in our culture. However, it's becoming a norm in our, in our present day. So perhaps in our education system, we need to relook really at factoring in the issue of, of, of anti corruption and, 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 and teaching our children about the impacts of that. It's not like, like it's an issue of stealing a small sweet and it's okay. You steal a small sweet tomorrow, tomorrow you steal a five cent, tomorrow you steal a 10 tomorrow you steal a The next day, there's nothing in your house because you've stolen everything. So it's, 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 it, we, need yeah. to, we need to inculcate that culture. You know, so it's definitely, it is, it must be from, 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 from bottom up. I agree very well. Uh, and then um, I was saying as Africa, oh, you are saying about the issue of the cultural change. I was saying the, the, the risk with us as Africans is that we, we are very submissive in our culture and it's a good thing, but it can also work against us because we then tend to over submit. And that yeah. is why 
you find that somehow our leaders take advantage of that because they know that because of, you know, we submit to authority. So even yeah. if we want to stomach certain things, we stomach them because we know in our culture that, you know, because they're in authority, we can't speak against them. And therefore that, that on its own, good as it is, has worked against us because then we do not, um, we, we do not fight what we're supposed to fight. I'm not saying physically fight, don't get me wrong, but we do, we do not stand up for these causes that we're supposed to stand for because we know we submit. So maybe so if, if you look at our history, all our four, former fathers, they didn't submit. They didn't submit to, to governments of the time. They didn't submit to any of them. They had to not be submissive for us to be where we are today, to be free, to be independent, to be liberated. So it's our time now, even as this generation, to say, you know what, we've, maybe we've over submitted. You know, we're not, we're, not, we're not necessarily saying there must be regime change. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that. We are trying to create a process where we allow young people in a democratic and sensible and responsible and, and constitutional manner to find their voice and to tackle all these issues that impact on us and impact on our livelihoods directly today. I hope I've answered you, my brother. Yes, yes, you answered me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, comrade uh, Coffee Fresh, please. Your turn. Yeah, thank you, Uncle Vigana. Um, that was a brilliant uh, delivery. Um, uh, the issue, one, one thing I would like to contribute is that um, uh, the issue of uh, corruption is so endemic. Um, and uh, if you look constitutionally, um, our political leaders keep extending their, their terms of office. Um, that's one big area. Mm -hmm. And there have to be ways to prevent that. Um, some of, if you look at some of the countries, the uh, chief justice and attorney generals are appointed by the ruling president. So therefore, if there are corrupt practices, it makes it even difficult to sentence anybody because uh, they are all in it together. Um, the regulatory bodies in some of those countries, for instance, um, I'm not going to mention any country. Um, but in some of the countries, if you look at the food, the, um, the food and drugs board, the food and drugs standards, um, when goods are brought into the country, and you expect this regulatory body in, bodies in these countries to check that these goods are fit for the purpose to be in the community, sometimes you have people bribing these regulatory bodies, and they will allow these fake products to be in a system for people to consume. And this is an example of uh, corrupt practices. And it's like, it's, it's so raw everywhere. You know, the structures are so bad. And I, I feel that, um, and some of the regulatory bodies are also appointed by the ruling president of the day. So if the president goes away or the prime minister goes away, they appoint a new person, they will put their person in charge and then bring in their own products. Uh, friends and family products will be brought in the system to allow those goods to be brought in. So. Um, the, it's come to a point that, as you said, the youth have to take um, a very uh, affirmative action to make sure that we, we eradicate all these problems. Um, and I think the youth parliament is a great, is a great idea. And uh, I'm looking at it in a structure where um, we don't, these days because of uh, Zoom and um, all this technology of meetings, we don't even have to think that one needs a, a building to actually have meetings, the youth, for the youth to have meetings. So if we look at an, a, a youth, parliament, youth parliament from the top, where you have a representation, about three uh, people, three being an odd number, three people representing every 55 states. So you have the, the diaspora being the, the last state, obviously, but 54 states were three, three times 55, been at the main helm of the, the, uh, the African Youth Parliament system where they would deliberate. And but at the same time, it's important that when these uh, three times 55 people actually meet, there has to be some powers they, they will have. Otherwise, um, those parliamentary decisions uh, from the country states, people will be a bit um, disillusioned because they will need those, uh, there'll be some, there has to be some powers, you know, some bills of uh, uh, action should be brought into uh, uh, the, the, the main body. At the same time, at the country level, I'm also thinking of an odd number about 11, 11 times 55 states. So that these 11 times 55 states then have a reporting system where they do um, uh, reports or have representation at the top, you know, 
and they should have a scope and a remit. Um, am I there? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So they, they should have a, a, a scope um, of reporting. Uh, the structure should be such that okay, we know when you uh, have to meet. All these um, uh, parliamentarians, and I'm I'm seeing that these are proper parliamentarians who have been elected. All these parliamentarians should go through an induction to understand how to be to to um, debate, how to pick up subjects, issues being brought up to them, to have a thorough discussion of of, of these issues, and then transfer them to, to the main body, which will have the power uh, for the, the various um, uh, uh, countries and national states. So um, I think it, it will be good because um, without involving the youth and educating them about um, um, preventing corrupt practices, it's, it's, it makes it very, very difficult for all us to move on as a country because the amount of money we lose every year from every single country uh, trust me, just the amount of corruption alone is, is enough to build so many hospitals and so many, um, revive so many industries on, on the continent of Africa, Africa. The amount of money lost through corruption is, is far too much to, to eradicate poverty, you know. So it, it, um, good, good people have to come together. And the expertise, we, we, it's come to the point where with all these various forums, we start trying to engage expertise from across uh, the, the, the continent and across in the diaspora as well, and put people in, in, in goods of their speciality, where people will be looking at, okay, you, this group is looking at constitution, these people are looking at the regulatory bodies of the, uh, the continent, this group is looking at that. And then you have one unifying body looking at the whole, you know, uh, shebang, you know, how, how, how things should be. And I think that is, uh, will be a way forward, contribute to the way forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that question, my brother. Uh, I love, I love it. Um, I totally agree with you um, with regards to um, what you said about uh, the presidents appointing the chief justices um, the, and, the, and the attorney generals, uh, and then as well as uh, I'll come back to the issue of the regulatory bodies and, and other uh, issues you've mentioned. With regards to that, I totally agree. Remember, I said at the beginning that we are advocating for even um, to relook at our own constitutions themselves and to have a legal study, um, you know, by the fundies in law. To what extent is the separation of powers, and what extent is the independence um, uh, situation there? Because we can't disperse the fact that uh, political appoint appointism, if I can put it that way, political appointments, they have a direct risk on democracy itself, depending on whoever is in charge as the president of a country at that time. That we cannot, we cannot, um, you know, we cannot overlook that it's a reality, it's a fact. It's happened many times, and therefore, we have to look at a situation where we study even the very same fabric of our constitutions to, to check, to, to check those, those, those gaps so that we are able to, to through the AU, to are able to, um, you know, to, to drive that reform, to say, you know what, the other thing that is causing possibly a leadership crisis or a, a situation where the rule of law is not as strong as it ought to be is perhaps because of the fact that um, even the very appointment of the very same people that should be leading um, you know, uh, our, our justices are actually, um, you know, um, are linked to whoever is there politically or appointed politically. And therefore there is that risk or that room for political interference to drive an agenda in favor of whoever, the political appointee will drive an agenda in favor of whoever has appointed them. Therefore, we may have to look at situations whereby we say, do we then say perhaps parliament uh, as, as a representation of all the constituencies, constituencies, sorry, from all the different political parties, should maybe be looked at as the as 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 the as the as the, as the, as the formation of the body to look at um, um, appointing these people directly. We don't know. It's a debate that needs to happen. It's a legal debate. It's a legal and political debate that needs to take place. So it's something very important, and that's why I'm saying we are want to we want to drive those reforms. Uh, as ourselves, as a people, of, as a representation group of a civil, of a civil society representation group to our AU to say, well, perhaps we need to look at even the fabric of our very own laws and our, and our constitution, even in terms of appointing, um, you know, the, uh, the justices as well as, um, as well as our, as our national prosecuting heads. Uh, that has also been another thorn in our own country where there's been the political interference um, that you know, we know through, through the, the cases in law and through 
you know, through history, we know this, it's all there, we know. But um, by having a, a national prosecuting authority that is appointed by a president, it weakens the entire prosecution body uh, because of the fact that obviously the political appoint, appointee has to respect or to a certain extent draw the line uh, of their political head, which is the president of the country of the, uh, at that time. So we need to probably look, you have to have, to have, to have a, re, a re look at the law because you know the law is evolving all the time. Democracy evolves all the time and nothing stops us to say, perhaps one of the things that we have subjected us to be in a situation whereby we are unable to deal with all these cases, we're unable to deal with all these presidents that I know have, be, have, have had all these uh, issues befalling upon us and the corruption and all that, that's cost us so much, is to perhaps have a look at the very fabric of our own constitution as well and say, do we really look and have a reform and say, perhaps we've done it this way, but maybe it's, it's about time to say, let's open this up and say, can maybe it be voted, maybe get, um, get uh, appointed, sorry, get uh, interviewed by the relevant structures, but the, the final say maybe can happen with a, in a border formation, in a more democratic formation of all the members of parliament when they've checked, you know, uh, 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 all, all, all these people. I know in our country with the public protector, the process is very, is very, is very, is very well done because it involves all the members of uh, parliament, all the leaders from the different political parties. So it's more democratic in that sense. But perhaps it's, you know, as a, as from a legal point of view, it's a debate to say, do we then have a look at perhaps using that same, um, same model to apply to how we appoint our justices and how we appoint uh, chief, the chief justice per se, and how we appoint um, even the, how we appoint even the national director of public prosecution who's in the prosecution head in each country. So it's something that's actually worth taking on. And actually, I welcome that very well. And then um, you mentioned the issue of regulatory bodies and food uh, uh, standards and you know the compromises there, uh, maybe th things entering our borders without having properly being checked, uh, fake products entering the African market and finding themselves in our, in our, in our shores and you know, in, in our trade. Um, um etc cetera, etc cetera. i think that the one you mentioned was uh the scope and the remit uh and the reporting systems etc so all of those things then they become uh, you know they become a broader body of what i said is to say because you know we have these issues the thing is we haven't had these debates we haven't had these talks so it's important i'm actually quite, quite glad that all these issues are coming out because it then allows us to start to say you know what we are having this common problem across the continent. Is it prob probably a time to relook at how we've been doing things before and to and, and, and to reform the change? And so I like the fact that you mentioned the issue of um, the fake products. I know it's a huge thing, and that is directly linked to our laws. Remember, our regulatory bodies are, are appointed to our laws. So that also is another reform in our legislation as well. And having monitoring systems in place, I always say the nice thing about you know uh, about Africa is that we you know in our country per se we have all the beautiful laws and stuff, but there's no implement there's 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 weak implementation if I can put it. I don't say there's not there's none. It's weak. It's there. It's weak because there's no strength in monitoring mechanisms that are there, in driving the accountability that we want to see, including those regulatory bodies, etc. So in that uh, be that said, the debate now should be. When we re-look at the laws, do we then even re-look at who monitors the legislation? Who monitors these regulatory bodies themselves? You know, that's why I'm saying by having such a structure like the, the, the Pan-African Youth Parliament that I was speaking about, these are the kind of debates that you want to have. These are the kind of issues you want to elevate at that level without any political interference. Because remember, they don't belong to any political party and there's no one country is better than the other. It's a, it's a, it's a structure of all uh, youth across the continent that speaks to issues that affect them directly. So these are the issues that you want to bring up and then bring them formally to the AU and say, you know what? We need to probably relook at the laws, the constitution, the laws, the separation of powers, and then also relook at even our regulatory, our regulatory bodies, the, the formation thereof and the monitoring thereof. How strong are our mechanisms of monitoring? Are they working? Are they not working? What are the gaps? What are the strengths? What are the weaknesses? So we need to do that SWOT analysis. I don't, I don't have all the answers right now in this, in, in, this, in this meeting, but I am noting these issues down because I think these are the issues that we that need to drive our debate, that need to drive even the issues that drive the discussions that we have in our parliaments to say, let's have a look at these things because if we don't, if we leave them unchecked, you know, we, 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 we're going to carry on inheriting all these, 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 these things. We're going to carry, in fact, we, even, we end up, uh, we have uh, an issue of drugs in our country. God knows how they get in, but they are there in all our respective countries. 
We have fake products floating all over. How they make it to our customs into our, to, into our borders, only God knows. So that shows you the extent of the weakness of all these monitoring mechanisms that are there. So that is why we need to elevate these issues for precisely that reason. Have I answered your question, my brother? Uh, yes, you, you, you've answered it. And then one thing you must uh, remember, uh, we also have to find ways so we can design the powers at the, the Pan-African Youth Parliament. They should have some, some elements of powers um, so that people can refer to. Um, yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, thank you for that. In fact, I was going to bring that up, that point, um, that this body will have to become independent so that it does not get uh, bullied it doesn't get infiltrated and it doesn't get to be um, subject to any political party or any power or any or any country. So either we have to look at the issue of having it to become an independent structure uh, and therefore um, to give it its own powers and its own, obviously it will, it will have to be uh, guided. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a young, it's a young, it's a new formation, it's a young body, but it will have to be guided and without necessarily interfering in its powers and in, 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 in its work. But we do want to elevate that voice the same way that our, for, our former uh, our forefathers gave our fathers who gave us elaboration that space to actually become independent and in driving the change. So we want to actually also do that without imposing anything on, on, on any of the other political or otherwise. So we, so I do note your point. It's actually quite a crucial point. Thank you very much. Have I answered your question? Yes, you have. OK. You have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think we have many more questions, but uh, because of time constraint, uh, we can answer all the questions. Maybe in the future, we'll bring back uh, uh, Comrade Kosazana again to talk about this corruption thing because it seems many people are very interested in it. Yeah, of course, we are supposed to be because uh, like one of uh, the participants mentioned, Africa loses about 150 million, a billion USD every year on corruption. We know in many countries, you find so many of the people who were uh, tasked with uh, taking care of the resources or money of the country in jail because instead of taking care of it, they took it for themselves. So it's something. So um, I would like to call on our project director, Mr. Amos Onyango, to, to say a few words before we end the, the event. And thank you guys very much for attending. We hope to see you okay. next time during our next event. Thank you. Okay. Yes, uh, Emma. Before, before, before I must okay. come in, sorry. Okay. Uh, sorry brother. Yes. Please come on. Um, there's just one uh, element that I just, I'm seeing now on the chest. And please, uh, before, before you, you, you let everyone leave the meeting, I want to spend time just going through the comment when the meeting has ended. If you allow me the space, I'm seeing there's a lot of contribution on the comments. So I wouldn't like to miss it when you just cut off and then I haven't had a, a chance because I was speaking to actually go through it. But before you go through Amos, um, I would like to have a look at, uh, there's somebody who's mentioned something very critical on the, on the comments. I think it's James uh, Namanona. Nama, 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 sorry, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing correctly, but he's saying something very crit critical about the fact that uh, while we may encourage youth to stand up against corruption uh, without ensuring a safe environment can put them in danger, I agree. I fully agree with that. And that um, more than 60% of the youth would refrain from reporting corruption. Thank you for that point, that's true. Uh, because of security reasons, because of fear, um, this shows that security and safety are important issues to take into account when engaging youth in anti-corruption. I fully agree with that point. I think that's something that is worth taking, taking into cognizance, knowing what we've seen in Mali uh, in context to what, to what is just saying now, what we've seen in Mali happening and what we are seeing happening in Zimbabwe as well, and what we are seeing happening based generally across the continent. We know that, uh, that that risk of security and safety is real. It's there and it's a real threat. So um, in us forming this, uh, this um, Pan-African Youth Parliament, we'll have to take into consideration uh, that some countries are less exposed than others. Some are more at risk from a security point of view than others are. So most definitely something that is worth noting and I will, I will take it up. Uh, thank you for bringing that point, James. It's a very crucial point. Thank you very much. Okay, you are welcome. Thank you. Yes, Comrade Amas. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Sister Kozana, for, for, for your good uh, presentation. I don't know if I pronounce your name correct. 
<laughs> yeah, but I'm very grateful for this. Uh, on behalf of the Piano Lumba Foundation, we just extend our sincere gratitude for the wonderful uh, presentation you have made. And I think uh, many young people across uh, Africa and even in Africans in diaspora uh, were able to listen to this conversation. We hope to engage you more in future events. And when we send our invitation, we, we do hope that you accept with your permission. Uh, now, on behalf of everyone who, who has been listening, we are also very grateful. We hope that this conversation will go ahead to ensure that uh, we make Africa a better place because that is our main goal. Otherwise, thank you and back to you, Salif. Okay. Uh, I think we have kept uh, our sister here for a very long time. Uh, maybe it's time for us to go. Yeah. So thank you very much. And thanks a lot. And see you next time. Bye. Before I continue, before you close, uh, my brothers, oh. please do not, do not log off because I want to go to the comments uh, thoroughly. So I, I allow everyone to leave and leave me.